Hello, and welcome to Replay Value. Carolyn Tuesday got off to a great start and frankly exceeded the expectations I had for this Shinichiro Watanabe and Studio Bones production, which is impressive since I hold both of them in high regard. Openings are hard. To introduce so many elements in a compelling way can be difficult, but this show makes it look easy. And because I'm a sucker for breaking down how a show introduces and empowers its themes through almost every element of its production, we'll be taking a look at the premiere episode of Carol and Tuesday and how it capitalizes on this idea of connection. We begin with a flash forward opening, which structurally tells us where the story we're about to join is going. It's a journey to discover what the miraculous seven minutes that embedded itself into the history of Mars was, and specifically the two girls that brought it to bear. The scene is all of 20 seconds, but it contextualizes the story, and gives this first episode the sense of building towards something grandiose that it otherwise lack. It also makes the titular names Carol and Tuesday carry some weight, which is doubly important since we follow that title card up with the clumsy escape of one of our two main characters. Tuesday's entire runaway sequence is a great example of how we can learn so much about a character through subtleties. She's got a huge room that feels traditional, almost Victorian in style, and her initial attempt to go out the window, a very cliché runaway style, is avoided as she just walks out the front door. Because of that, we can see that Tuesday was by no means a literal prisoner in that home, able to unlock the gate herself, which tells us that she wasn't being held there against her will and that it's for some other reason that she wants to leave what appears to be on the surface a cushy living situation. As she exits the gate, a nice guitar and keyboard melody come into the audio. A nice combination of the fact that she's holding a guitar and symbolic for the musical journey she's setting out on. Her dialogue affirms that she's a bit naive. She looked up how to run away online, probably why she tried to escape through the window initially. And unfortunately for the tired Tuesday, her plan to ride the suitcase doesn't last long. You can still see the donut sign in the back of this shot. Tuesday's journal tells us that her adventure started on April 11th, the same day that this first episode aired, and sets Cindy Lauper as the idol in whose footsteps she's following. She's idealistic for sure. Tuesday doesn't really have a plan outside of wanting to be a musician, and that alone is enough for her to swallow her fears and to get on her first ever train. And speaking of trains, while her cliche window escape didn't work out, her cargo bay ride is certainly a traditional one. When she wakes up the following morning, her eyes adjusting to the brand new day and what it holds in store, we see her destination. New York si oh wait, sorry, Alba City. You'll have to forgive me for that one. An island that's connected to land by bridges with giant skyscrapers, a giant statue welcoming people into the city, surrounding areas that are still considered said city with their own stylistic flair with one of them having a similar style to 1960s Brooklyn with the bridge linking that section architecturally similar to the Brooklyn Bridge. There's a lot more evidence for this on later in the show too, but for now, Alba City is likely based on the name Alba Mons, an actual Mars volcano, and presumably the statue is of Mars, the Roman god of war who's called Ares in Greek. And the keyboard track we hear as we overview the city brings us naturally to meet the other main character, the keyboard wielder, whose living situation is a little bit different than Tuesday's. Carol's home has a studio setup. Tons of unpacked boxes that serve as tables. It's got an industrial feel with the pipes and thick metal railings. A far cry from the Victorian setup that Tuesday had. And this sequence is a lot about building contrasts between the two, not only in physical appearance and in style of the two characters, though Carol getting ready for the day certainly draws that distinction, much more practical modern clothing versus the frilly dress, but also through the music, which has this percussion heavy beat and a groovy bass line with what sounds like a xylophone playing the melody. It's a great match to how Carol flows effortlessly on her board, another contrast to Tuesday, and to the city itself with the graffiti and packed together buildings compared to Herschel's much more suburban and open fields. It's cool, in other words, and how Carol characterizes Alba, where nobody's go to be somebody's, explains why Tuesday chose Alba. We also see that Carol's street smarts are on lock when she stops the kid from shoplifting. And her acknowledgement of Alba as a dog-eat-dog -dog city indicates that she's a bit more of a realist. As she says, Because we started with Tuesday's arrival to the city, and now have characterized it through Carol, 
were firmly planted in Alba as the setting for the show, which is further confirmed when we briefly cut back to Tuesday in a massive terminal called Grand Station, only missing a central there, with tons of people, a huge contrast to the Herschel Station platform. With the differences between Carol and Tuesday fleshed out, at least to some degree, we enter the next thematic section, which shows how both characters are struggling in the city on their own. For instance, we see Carol working as a server at a fast food joint, which shows us how degrading her job can be, as one customer treats her like dirt and the other like an escort. However, despite her position, she's able to get the last laugh, to the unpleasant surprise of her bratty customers making the jumping set meal a literal jump. We transition from Carol, satisfied in dealing just desserts, to her spot being filled by the Lone Tower, a nice partial match cut. Tuesday is doing her best navigating the crowded city, but we see further proof of her insulated upbringing as her bag gets stolen while she wasn't paying attention. The city is a big change for her, Stardust Plaza is full of colorful advertisements, and there's this one line that keeps being repeated on the tickers. Don't expect much of the future, but every step you take will build it, followed by either stop looking back, you can't change the past, or don't lose your focus. Which is a nice enough motto in isolation, but it's also nice slight support for Tuesday, who stated on the train that she might have made a mistake. Really though, this motto feels like it will be relevant later in the plot, in which case it's good foreshadowing. The transition to a new character, Angela, is a great one, match cutting her live ad in the promenade to her filming it in studio. As the session comes to a close, the switch to Angela's point of view reveals a mostly empty room with a robot seemingly serving as both cameraman and director, the humans in the room being diminished by the change in focus. This is the first notion that the arts, at least commercially, are machine run, another industry automated by algorithms to maximize profit margins. Angela, angry about having to do the crappy durian soda ad, fires her manager rudely. These three scenes are connected in that they highlight the downside of human interaction. Carol, who gets mistreated at work and in turn bites back, resulting in her being fired. Tuesday, whose property is stolen. And Angela, who lacks agency in selecting her own jobs. As well as her manager, who gets berated. It's fitting then, that in the aftermath of this, we see the power of genuine human connection through Carol and Tuesday's first meeting. The show has already gone above and beyond by highlighting their differences through just about every means possible in scene and audio construction. And here again, it's done on this bridge, fittingly since bridges are a great symbol of connection. Carol enters from the right and Tuesday on the left. Even their positioning on the bridge itself is on opposite sides horizontally. Tuesday, in the aftermath of her bag getting stolen, thinks about going home but resolves to move forward. And Carol states that her music won't reach anyone on this bridge, that no one has any interest in a girl like her, but that regardless, she wants to sing, her own resolve manifesting. But it turns out that she's wrong on the first two of those counts, as her music reaches Tuesday, who stops to listen, and connects with it, bringing her to tears. Her takeaway of a sad song that tries to be strong is affirmed by Carol. Carol's song didn't only have Tuesday listening, it also had a pair of seagulls, and a security officer who the two girls have to run away from. <laughs> Which is a fun tongue-in-cheek laugh at their names, just as the two birds take off to the sky towards Alba City proper. Maybe some symbolism in the direction of their fated pairing. As we return from the ad catches, which I love aesthetically, we rejoin Angela, who is a big enough name to attract a small crowd. Inside the car, we meet Angela's mama, who she positions away from. Add this plodding brass tune, and it breathes discomfort into the scene. Mama is overbearing and dominates the shots she's in. And as she threatens to make Angela's manager's AI from now on, Angela says not to do that because then she won't be able to bully them suggesting that the way that Angela achieves freedom from Mama is to use the human intermediary to do what she wants, as opposed to an AI who would just do commands from Mama. It's also not a great look for Angela. It makes the audience a bit more wary of her if the previous firing scene didn't already. As Mama grabs Angela's face to highlight her point about effectively controlling her, something Angela doesn't want but is forced to put up with, just balls up her hands. And thus we enter the thematic section of the episode that's about parents. 
The audio sound of turbines and rotors brings us back to Herschel and the Simmons house, as we meet the two individuals who appeared in Tuesday's flashback on the bridge. If we needed confirmation that they were super wealthy, the hover jet that lands on their property is good proof. Notably, the older woman's reaction, presumably her mother, but at the very least her guardian, isn't about whether Tuesday is safe or not, but rather, what's there to be displeased with? And then saying, as though she can't fathom why Tuesday would run away. It's a concern with the material, as made clear by her gesturing to the house, and not the emotional, which the guitar is the embodiment of, which we understand both through Tuesday's earlier flashback and when Spencer mentions that she took the guitar with her, leading to the brief realization they both have. Spencer's mother designates responsibility of Tuesday running away to him. She's very hands-off compared to Angela's adult figure, and is more concerned with her own job than Tuesday. Later on, we get a comment about the fact that Carol's always been on her own and that her folks aren't around, which adds more fuel to this parenting comparison. Two hands on, two hands off, not there at all. Which makes the Tuesday-Angela situations the most comparable, frankly, and should be something to keep an eye on in the future. We return to Angela and Mama as they enter Artinence Lab, which has this bizarre syncopated electric music that's a little bit hard to listen to. It truly sounds like a computer program created the song and is such a huge tonal shift from all the instrument-focused work we've heard up to this point. Mr. Tao has invited Angela here to be a puppet for the music his AI creates since she desires to be a singer. The shot of the tower they're in, as he states her status makes it clear that he's the real big shot. Angela and Mama aren't really in the same league, which is why Mama tries to butter him up as they enter. As Tao outlines the terms of their deal, he walks straight past Mama, since she's not the person who has to be okay with being a puppet, and to Angela, who responds that that's fine. But the shot selection suggests that it's not that simple. Her face is angled downwards to challenge the height-power dynamic in the shot, and as she walks past him, she says, <laughs> Which suggests that she's viewing this like it's a springboard, that she doesn't plan on always being a puppet. And Tao seems to recognize this as he stares back at her. We follow that up with Carol and Tuesday checking out Carol's digs which leads to introducing Ziggy and them drinking the soda that Angela was promoting earlier. As they talk about Tuesday running away from home, her never having played guitar in front of anyone before being the question that launches us into a full-on response, we cut from Carol about to drink to a drink being poured at a bar. We see another one of those screens for ordering, and for the clearly intoxicated gentleman, that's an opportunity to ask for the barkeep. Between this, the big jump burger from earlier, and Angela's comments in the car, we see that there's a need for human interaction when it comes to emotions. The guy who was angry about his coffee being bitter can't really rant to that about an AI. Angela bullying her managers to not have her do dumb shoots and as a guard against mama can't do that as an AI. And in this much less harmful case, Gus saying to change the music could be done with an AI, but his emotional dislike wouldn't be conveyed and perhaps ignored. Speaking of the music in the bar, it's not entirely dissimilar to the music that was playing in Artinence Lab, in that the rhythm feels slightly off and as though it was made by putting together a bunch of drum kits from GarageBand haphazardly. Gus, who we learn is a former member of the music industry, passes out and we return to Carol and Tuesday, a brief establishing shot that conveys the mix between futuristic society and older designs. Two things that are opposites but work really well together as we continue with the importance of that human emotional connection with Tuesday explaining why she ran away from home. As this nostalgic piano tune plays, mixing a downtrodden feeling with a kind of positive outlook, Tuesday says that she felt alone at home and at school, but then Cindy Lauper's titular true colors caused her to cry, as it said the thing she most wanted to hear in that it seemed to understand her. For Carol, she was a refugee. Whether that's by war or disaster is unclear, though it explains the lack of parents and the likelihood that her flashback is her being passed over for adoption. During her time in the camp, a singer named Flora visited, and that coolness made her desire to be a singer. Carol can come up with melodies no problem, but she states that something is missing and restates more broadly, <laughs> brings in what's missing, lyrics that just wouldn't stop flowing when she heard the song, and with that, we enter 
the jam session. The jam session is definitely the emotional core of the episode and arguably the best moment in the whole show so far. It's the climax of the episode and brings together all of these threads that have been introduced up to this point. The fact that they're so different and looking for connection, their mutual desire to sing and let feelings out, to be a musician. And so it's pretty amazing that this no dialogue sequence is able to convey so much just through the subtleties in the way it's shot and in the characters. Tuesday starts off super nervous. She's never played in front of anyone before, after all, and strums out some chords quickly. Carol keeps an eye out for her to make sure that they're in sync, slowing down her pace until Tuesday is ready. It's a testament to Carol's welcoming nature that Tuesday feels so comfortable so fast. A huge departure in terms of emotional safety than what Tuesday must have had at home or even earlier today in the city. Even still, Tuesday plays on the softer side and follows Carol's lead on the humming. But neither of them are perfect and they miss their notes and timings a bit, just as you would expect, especially when they try out some new stuff. But when the lyrics come into play, Tuesday immediately seems like she's in her element, taking the lead for the singing. The repeated lyric, can you feel my tears, they won't dry, is as literal as you can get about emotional connection. Can you touch my sadness? This desire to share this emotion, and also for contact. Can you understand me, who is alone, the loneliest girl? I love the way this scene is shot. It's really warm and to scale. It doesn't treat it any bigger than two girls playing music together in a room, even though we know that it eventually leads to something super grand. Ziggy and the viewer are the only ones watching, and there's something very comforting and personal about that. We even get a shot from outside to establish how lucky we are to be on the inside and to reestablish that scale. The ending of the song is really surprising that it ends with just silence. And then there's the slight emotional whiplash of sadly singing the loneliest girl to a positive yay. But it makes sense that there's no big impact within the context of the show and that it doesn't overstate the moment. This one song didn't redefine anything globally and their happiness over finding someone to emotionally connect to and play music with certainly overrides the emotions that led to loneliest girl's creation. They are no longer lonely, at least for the moment. It also speaks to music's ability to connect people despite the fact that they are opposites in so many ways. True Colors, our episode title, and Sydney Lauper's song speaks to this as well. As Cindy Lauper sings about how she understands the true you and that you should let it show. Tuesday took that message to heart, going to Alba City to try and follow her dreams of being a musician, her true self. And this jam session is more the embodiment of that. Tuesday getting to be herself now that she's left home that felt stifling, and Carol having someone to connect to the music she makes that she never thought would happen on the bridge. It's also a song about being there for people that you care about, and making your way through life together, which is a nice foreshadowing element for the partnership that's about to be formed. Which happens as the two girls go onto the roof with a really fun keyboard and guitar melody playing in the background as they look towards Alba City. The use of Instagram as a double exposure and to solidify their partnership is a great shot. And the following fist bump and excitement over their duo name, Carol and Tuesday, are a great way to set up future episodes. But before that, to end off the episode, we foreshadow an eventual meeting with Gus, who was the narrator for the opening scene as well, just as we end the episode with to be continued. I have two straight thoughts before we wrap this up. The ending credits theme is perfect, and I physically cannot stop listening to it, and I hope, for the love of all that is holy, that every car in Alba City is a self-driving one that's connected to some kind of overseer, because this infrastructure right here is terrible and bound to cause accidents. Crossing over inbound traffic? Absolutely insane. In all seriousness, what I love about this Carol and Tuesday premiere is how it executes on its critical theme of connection in a variety of ways. Through the use of setting and small world building elements, and not only through the primary character's interaction, but in the musical instruments that relate to them as it affects the sound design. It also points out the downsides of human connection, and perhaps why it's been minimized in this society. And so it feels safe to say that this idea of connection will be one of the core themes moving forward. But we'll be able to see how it evolves next week because I'm happy to announce that Understanding Harmony, a breakdown of Carol and Tuesday, will be my second analytical series in the same vein as Hyoka, coming out almost every week. I've wanted to cover a show weekly for the past six months, and I feel pretty safe with this one, and so I'm really excited. But that's enough about that. Hope you enjoyed this video. 
Let me know what you thought about Carol in Tuesday's first episode. Leave me a like if you enjoyed the work done here. And hey, consider subscribing if you want more Carol in Tuesday content brought straight to your inbox. But until next time, thanks for watching.